I would prefer not to comment on the specifics of the OGL drama, as I'd like to focus on role-playing games themselves. However, the proposed changes to the OGL have already had a detrimental effect on the hobby, with several third-party publishers already stating their intention to separate completely from D&D. Much wiser people than I have commented on the situation, specifically Ryan Dancy, who helped create the original OGL back in 2000. So I will make no further comment on the situation itself, which is still developing. However, this event has set a clear divide between Wizards and the wider RPG sphere of publishers and content creators, and destroyed the trust that was established with the creation of the original OGL. I don't have much stake in Dungeons & Dragons itself, as I have been playing Pathfinder and OSR games for the last 10 years. I previously played the starter set for 5th edition, and I have no real problem with the game itself. In fact, the rules seem pretty good. But I have no real investment in official Dungeons & Dragons at this stage. So, having said that, I would like to offer a few positive comments in this time of doom and gloom, and a few ideas on how to disentangle from official Dungeons & Dragons if you have not done so already. The changes to the OGL will have some negative short-term consequences, but I think overall this situation is going to be beneficial to the industry. The first thing that I would say is, if you currently have a subscription to D&D Beyond, just cancel it. This is the only metric that wizards are actually going to pay attention to. They care very little for any vocal response. Financially supporting something that you disagree with is counterintuitive. Now, on with the positives. Firstly, this is an opportunity to get hold of some of those great OSR games which currently use the OGL 1.0a license. There is a strong chance that these will not be available in the future, and even if the revocation of 1.0a is unsuccessful, these products may not be reprinted. I would urge you to go for the print option rather than the PDF where available. Some amazing OSR games which are sold at a great price are Basic Fantasy Roleplaying, Delving Deeper, and White Box Fantastic Medieval Adventure Game. Each of these is around the $5 mark and provide everything you need to play. Slightly more expensive, but definitely worth looking into, is Dungeon Crawl Classics. Swords and Wizardry and Osric are both retro clones of original D&D and first edition D&D, and both important retro clones. I would also recommend Old School Essentials, though I find that getting hold of a print copy can be a challenge depending on your location. You could pick up some of the original D&D rules, such as Basic or First Edition, either from Drive-Thru RPG or from eBay. I don't know to what extent Drive-Thru will be affected by the changes Wizards have announced, but it would not be a bad idea to get some print or PDF products while they are still easily available. Explore other non-OGL products, games like Into the Odd, Knave, Five Torches Deep and Cairn. They utilise different mechanics to produce games that are similar to D&D but with their own flavour. There are some key tropes in D&D that you might miss, but there are lots of changes which are welcome. I imagine that a lot of these games' mechanics will start to bleed into the mainstream OSR, as most of these games are under Creative Commons license. There are some great YouTubers and bloggers that focus on the OSR side of role-playing, such as Ben Milton at Questing Beast and Bandit's Keep. I imagine that alternative RPGs will start to be featured on other channels that currently focus on D&D. For blogs, I can recommend Grognardia and Delta's D&D Hotspot, but there are loads more out there. If you have a lot of 5e products and dread moving to a different system, rest assured that converting things to OSR systems is not as difficult as it may seem initially. Keep an open mind, don't be too beholden to perfectly adhering to the rules, and use the opportunity to make the changes you've always wanted to see. I'm sure that as people jump ship from 5e, various conversions will appear online. Having converted things to different systems in the past, I can attest that it can be a rather fun experience that also provides a greater understanding of game design in general. 
Speaking of adhering to the rules, allow yourself to make changes to how the game works. Sticking with the official rules is very helpful for players with new groups or in a tournament situation, if such things even occur nowadays. But in an established group, allow yourself to be less restricted by the rules and driven more by intuition and whatever makes the game more fun. This is one of the principles of the OSR, not that the DM completely disregard the rules, but that he is malleable to the situations in game. The actions of wizards have confirmed their intention to focus on the digital path and create a clear divide between digital D&D and what we will call folk D&D. The proposed changes to the OGL have more or less enforced that division. Those that want the more digital experience are likely opposed to the philosophy of the folk D&D faction. Having such a clear separation may be a blessing and will create more unity within the folk D&D faction. As part of disentangling from D&D, I would advise embracing the analogue. I'm a firm believer that choosing the analogue option over the digital one is often more satisfying, despite usually being less efficient. Use pen and paper, draw maps, roll real dice, don't use apps while you are playing, and use your imagination instead of Google Images. Only use applications to do tasks that would be too onerous or time-consuming on paper, such as using, using Excel to deal with massive amounts of data. In my opinion, the analog experience is better and reduces the number of products that you grow to rely on. There is something about physically interacting with your game that adds to the experience and nothing beats a hand scrawled character sheet written out on lined paper. As Wizards intends to move into the digital sphere, it is a good idea to explore non-digital solutions to play. Digital play is ultimately more restrictive than it first appears. As part of this division, there may be a drop in profits as folk D&D becomes more of a niche. We may see a reduction in the number of creators and products, at least for a time, but that may not mean a drop in quality. In fact, there may be benefits to a market that is not oversaturated. People will create for the game whether or not they make a profit. This is especially true of the nerd culture of D&D. Those who create products regardless of monetary gain are the most invested. Sometimes there is a benefit to a mass cull which separates the wheat from the chaff, as those who survive will be all the more invested. It would be a great shame, of course, to those who currently make money from the hobby to lose income, and many great products may be difficult to get hold of going forward. But there could be long-term benefits to the hobby. Such periods of instability and increased restrictions also breed creativity. So we may begin to see a true renaissance in the tabletop RPG world. Early indications suggest companies will adapt to the situation and carve out new avenues in the RPG environment, potentially with new open source systems which could rival Dungeons & Dragons. There is some active work that can be done to help during this transition period. It may be of use to analyse the current SRD for both 3rd and 5th edition to determine which parts are non-copyrightable game mechanics and which are not. This would help creators determine what they can legally use for their own systems and perhaps a true open source version of D&D could be created, though of course this is a massive legal grey area. The OSR publishers for Basic Fantasy and Swords and Wizardry are already attempting to divorce their games from the OGL, and the result will be sets of rules which help to more clearly define what is and what isn't property of Wizards of the Coast. Explore the world of independent publishers and promote products and designers that you enjoy. If you already create content for D&D, consider branching out to other systems. The more creators that abandon D&D for other systems, the more traction those systems will receive, and the less that D&D receives. Remember that the game you run at home can never be taken away from you, unless all of your gaming books are online locked behind some kind of subscription. And whatever actions wizards take, the game will survive in one way or another and will adapt. 
These kind of events have occurred before. I think it is worth bearing in mind that most people who play or purchase D&D have no idea what the OGL is and will be indifferent to the direction that Wizards takes. Though the reaction to the situation has had a broader reach than I had expected. Even so, after some time, this debacle will be forgotten and new and existing customers will carry on as normal with Dungeons & Dragons. I think we can consider the OGL to be effectively dead, and the tabletop RPG hobby will now irrevocably change. The OGL was built on trust between wizards and third parties. Even if wizards abandon all their proposed changes, or the revocation of 1.0a goes to court and wizards loses, the trust that was established with the OGL has been lost, and will not be easily regained. Several publishers have already stated their intention to abandon the OGL going forward, and I think most will follow suit. Signing the Open D&D petition online may possibly help to protect existing products that use the OGL, but it is of little other use. Wizards is a corporation and does not care about your opinion. Besides, the damage is done. A successful petition does not change the original intentions of the company. Unfortunately, Wizards probably does not care about the so-called D&D community. The community will change and adjust to whatever principles and practices that are established top-down from Wizards. Those who disagree will drift into a different group or will slowly align to the new reality. In my opinion, I think it is foolish to expect bottom-up change to occur, influencing a company to abandon their business plans in order to maintain goodwill with their customers. I may be wrong, but I think that the community is more likely to be influenced top-down by Wizards' decision than the other way around, at least in the long term. The biggest threat to Wizards and the most likely entity to dictate change in their policy is direct competition, as was seen with Paizo during 4th edition. Ultimately, I am looking forward to see which system is going to replace D&D. This is a great time to discover new systems and to support games which are built around an open source concept. Aside from the collateral damage that is going to occur in the next few years, there will be a lot of good things that come out of these events. Honestly, I think I would welcome the downfall of Wizards, which is a very different company than the, than the one that I liked 20 years ago. Sadly, there have been many examples of companies performing anti-consumer actions which received short-term backlash, but were basically unaffected in the long run. You may recall some of the blunders by Blizzard, EA and others in the video game world, which didn't truly have a lasting negative impact on those businesses. Still, the unity that I have seen within the tabletop RPG world recently has been surprising, and it seems that once the dust settles, an exciting new frontier is about to open up. When I started this channel, I intended to focus on OSR games, and I look forward to highlighting books from small companies and independent publishers. I currently have no intention of covering any new Wizards of the Coast products. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.